my mom was right. I see this now. <laughs> it is uh, like it's great to be here, and it's great to see so many. Well, I actually can't see faces, but it's great to see so many friends here. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's really awesome that we get to get together. We've all been on a long journey together. It's pretty cool that we're at this point with Getty with his uh, book. Was I guess you've read the book? Yeah. 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 I, I hear it has a lot of words. So <laughs> I'm not really big into words, as you can probably tell. So, <laughs> so let's get on with it. Uh, please. We're going to have a great time tonight. We're going to have a great, lots of great stories. And, and, uh, and I'm going to ask Getty now to please come out and join me. I love these guys. Holy shit. You haven't felt this love in a while. No, it's amazing. It's amazing. And on this stage yet. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I think the first time we were here was almost 50 years ago, 49 years ago. Yeah. 1974, November 74. Yep. Opening for? Uh, Nazareth. That's right. Wow. Yeah. Woo. This is great tonight because, you know, there's this thing called memory, which I've learned a lot about. And uh, looking back, to write about your life, you have memories of, excuse me, I'm talking. <laughs> we have memories of certain moments, and we've talked about this, how we'll be in the same room experiencing the same thing, but we have different memories of that thing because our memories are imbued with our emotions, and we remember things differently. So tonight is like heaven for me because we can fill in all each other's gaps. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Good night. Yes. <laughs> Shall we sit? Shall we sit? Let's sit. Fuck it, day. Fuck it, day. In your honor tonight. Yes. We have some special guests on. Yes, stage. I see. The girls are here. The girls, <laughs> your little Barbies are here. Although in a much more provocative pose than I would have expected for a man of your age. <laughs> <laughs> it was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> in my dog period. You uh, get the girls, I get the chicken. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's a deal. And some really great photos. There's there's a, a beautiful shot here of, of you and me and, and Pratt. Yeah, and that was on our very last tour and yeah. maybe the very last show, in fact, Soundcheck. Yeah. yeah. And here's you and I having a beer in Iceland together. Yes, in Reykjavik. That's right. Yeah. And. Do you want to explain this one? I don't know if people can see this charming photo of Alex. That's a, that's a, that, that a pig. That's a picture of a pig and a small pig. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm gonna laugh tonight. So. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> Serbians love pigs. They sure do, of course. These <laughs> 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 oh, oh, are multi we're cunning multilinguists. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this <laughs> this is a story. I'm gonna tell the story. Sure. Because tonight my job is to embarrass you as often as I can. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Again, and still. Uh, oh. So we were in a restaurant called St. John in London, and you know, his uh, Serbian heritage, they eat a lot of pork, suckling pig. And so at this restaurant, it was known for nose to tail eating. And so there we were having a fine meal, 
And the table next to us had ordered an entire suckling pig. And the gentleman brought the head at the very end of their meal for them to enjoy. Right. And I remember you watching the pig go by the pig's head like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you were staring at it. And then the table next to us refused the head. Yeah, they were grossed out. They were yeah. grossed out for some reason. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> so as the head was making its way past us, you stopped the waiter and you said, excuse me, don't they want that? Uh -huh. And the waiter said, no, sir, I'm afraid they don't. And you went, well, can I have it? <laughs> and they said, well, certainly. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody likes a little head once in a while. <laughs> looking at this picture, and he wanted to know why you're the same color as the pig's head. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I guess I was roasted that night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying when I am hanging around with you. That's right, okay. Now, were we there working? Yes. We were on tour? Working. Yeah, we were working. Because, of course, Al, uh, we have never gone on a holiday. That's true. Before, just for fun. Until recently. That's right. Yeah. We both went on a holiday together. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> and you survived. I did survive. Yeah. Yeah. No mean feat. Barely. No. Where to? So what do we do now? What do you want to talk about? Uh, we only have been together hanging around with each other for how many years? I know. Well. We were what? 14, 15? 13, 15? I think. When we met. 13. Yeah. We were 13 once. Yeah. Yeah, and we're what, 42 now? <laughs> it's, it's perfect. It's been 20 years. <laughs> oh, and yet, Louis. you still seem so well preserved. Uh, yeah. yes. yes, I do drink a lot of formaldehyde. <laughs> do you remember the first time you ever saw me? Oh, jeez. Uh, down so with my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was at school, it was a junior high mm -hmm. at R.J. Lang. That's right. Yeah. In North York. Yeah. I think, I, I think you were being beaten up. <laughs> and I was running through the woods to, to get away. So you were helping my as, 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 as I often do. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it was at R.J. Lang, in, yeah. in the hallway. I, I remember the first time I saw you was in R.J. Lang, and you were wearing a purple and white paisley shirt yes. with a fink hook on the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fink yeah, yeah, fink hook, yeah. And I, then I befriended a chap named Steve Shutt. Do you, do you know that? <laughs> yeah. Go, Hobbs, go! And go, Hobbs, go! Steve and I, and actually I was very thankful to befriend Steve Shutt because if you recall, he was a budding young hockey player even back then, yeah. and very well respected by everyone at the school. And at the time, I was one of the kids that was bussed into R.G. Lang from the new um, suburb, which was mostly Jewish kids. And they were taken too kindly to Jewish kids at that school, so whenever we walked from the parking lot of the bus to the school, it was a bit of a gauntlet we had to kind of run. And for some reason, Steve befriended me, and because he was such a cool guy, people just left me alone after that. So thank you, Steve, I was very grateful for that. Uh, but more importantly, we connected about music, and he used to say to me, uh, you see, we both bought bass guitars at the same time. There used to be a band in Toronto called the Poppers. Do you remember the Poppers? I mean, you probably don't, they way too young. Uh, but they had this bass player, Denny Girard, who yep. both Steve and I really admired, and after we saw them at North York Centennial Arena, yeah. we, we went, we decided we both needed to play bass, so we both took bass up. Didn't work out for him, uh, yeah. but he had this hockey stick that right. we really knew how to use. Yeah, and you were a shitty hockey player. Yes, I was. <laughs> but I was very good at skating on my ankles. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, so as I got better on the bass, he said to me, you have to meet this guy, Alex, I can't pronounce his last name, I think it's Eat a Sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, that guy, that blonde guy, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he introduced us. Really? And, and that elasticity. Yes, they say. I mean, I, we wouldn't be sitting here making bad jokes if it wasn't for Steve. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, but we don't have a Stanley Cup ring, though. That's, no, we don't. And he that's has one of the things. More than one. Yeah, he does. So we ended up being failures. <laughs> Shuddy <laughs> won the cup, eh? Shuddy won, won the cup, eh? <laughs> That's right. That's a good machine. That's a good machine. You yeah. shoot the puck in the corner and then you take you the body. You score the goal and you get the heart. That's right, exactly right. Oh, there's people here. Go on, of It's really unusual that Alex and I should be. I don't even call you Alex, but I'll, I'll, I'll use a proper form tonight. Okay. That Alex and I are sitting here without at least a glass of wine in front of us. Or a guitar. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that too. Yeah. Let's fix that. Well, let's fix it. Yeah. Do you remember the, the yeah, gig fix that? that. Here? Go. I, I guess you probably don't. Do you remember the, the gig? Which gig do you mean? Now? We played here the, 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 well, the first time with Nazareth. With Nazareth. I only remember I was really nervous backstage yeah. before we came out because I have come to, to this building to see so many bands as you have. Yeah. I sat right there to see the Cream play in 1968. Oh. Right on that balcony. And so many bands. So yeah. it was the honest of the place, the awesomeness of the place really did freak me out a bit before yeah. we came out. Yeah. yeah, exactly the same for me. Did you feel that way tonight when you came out here? Uh, well, well, once you barged into my dressing room. That was my dressing room. I know. But you're the old man. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was thinking of those gigs, and you know, we we played here so many times. We've been here so many times. Like you say, I, know I sat in that first row in the first balcony for so many shows. But um, when we recorded our first live album here, I remember that. Nazareth was nerve-wracking. We finally got it to Massey Hall, and, uh, but doing our first headline gig and yeah, it, w it was a really was exciting time. And, we, and yeah. the tape machine was rolling. Mm -hmm. And when you know the tape machine is rolling, you get tight. Uh, it's just a fact of life. Sure. And so every tiny mistake you make in your brain is amplified like yeah. error, 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 right. starts flash. Yeah, so quickly, make another one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know that feeling really, really well. <laughs> That's That's really excellent. Uh, yeah. yeah. yeah okay, then that's it. <laughs> yeah. Can I take these with me? If it's sure, right? if you have some yeah. use for them. Stop flirting with okay. him. Yeah, leave me alone. It's easily it's aroused. Reaching out. <laughs> you too, huh? <laughs> yeah, so. So, yeah, what are you going to ask me now, Big Shot? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Do you want to talk? Just, you want to talk about stuff? Like, sure. Yeah. Like, what kind of stuff? those shoes? Well, I got them in England. Oh, nice. Okay, okay. that's enough talking about shoes. You're supposed to ask me about my. My effing book. Oh yeah, your effing book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I uh, I did I did get to read his his book. Um, you were the first person. I got a it. yes. I got a, 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 an early copy. We wanted to. I think Ed wanted to make sure that he got his stories mostly right. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure he didn't hate me. After. Yeah, and, and just to read it. And I gotta say that. And I'm not just saying this because you're here. Okay. Um, so I'll look the other way, but I, I love the book. I really love it. I mean, obviously, I'm connected to a lot of the stories when we were kids and at your place and, of course, all the band and, and all of that. But I found that I was laughing out loud so often reading the book, and I cried. Oh, and I was just so focused and mesmerized by some of the stories and the flow of the writing itself. I, I didn't know. Talented. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> nice one. You could have started a band. I would have won. <laughs> <laughs> we love you guys. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you felt that way yeah. because it was very important for me, obviously, that you 
approved of the work because you're all over it. Yeah. You know, my, my story has you sitting beside me through most of it, right? Yeah. And, and even today. Even today. Isn't that amazing? It is really. amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. You, but more importantly, us and the story of our band and yeah. our life together, especially through the the great years, which were fun to write about. Yes. You know, writing about '74 and '75 and traveling across the country in a station wagon and sleeping on baggage and waking up and you were in the front seat beside uh, Howard, who's here tonight, and driving across the country. And there's all these corkscrews and knives sticking into the tar of the car somehow. Uh, you know. Uh, or the story of us driving three hours the wrong way to Cleveland on the highway because we maybe smoked a few too many joints, it's possible. It has been known to happen. Uh, so those kind of stories are so much, were so much fun to remember. Yeah. But when we got through the difficult years, of course, and, and uh, after 97, when tragedy struck Neil's life and, and dealing with some of that, I had to be very um, respectful and delicate, and I just wanted to make sure that you felt that way about how it was written. And of course, telling the story of the last number of years, because many people yeah. really don't know what went down in those years. Um, you guys remember the last gig, August of uh, 2015, but there was stuff going on, obviously, through our own feelings about right. how the band ended, and, right. and then dealing with the news of Neil's illness. Yeah. Um, it was harder to write that stuff. I bet it was. Yeah. yeah, those were very emotional times. I know in that tour, the tour was so great, and the whole construct of the tour was mm -hmm. just so much fun. Yeah. You know, going back from the previous tour all, all the way back to the beginning and mm -hmm. the stage, reflecting that, that change, and, it just worked so beautifully. And I thought we played so well on that tour as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's funny, because a lot of times, um, and this happens, I think, with a lot of bands, the audience is so caught up, they're, especially if they're fans, they want to hear the music, they're, they love the whole experience of being there, and they just take it all in, and it's great. And in your mind on stage, you go, ah, that's one of the worst nights I've ever played. <laughs> I've made so many stupid mistakes. You know, you're, you're so critical. Yeah, well, especially you. <laughs> yeah, no, I was really thinking about you guys. I never wanted to say anything. Oh, you're a loser. <laughs> so this is a good time to really get it. <laughs> but oh. I thought on that tour, we had more really, really good nights than, you know, those sort of bumpy, lumpy nights. Yeah. And it was, I know towards the end, we just became sadder yeah. that it was coming to a close. And I think if we'd done maybe 20 more dates, yeah. something close, closer to what we were doing previously, it would have been a little more satisfying, but I, I think we both felt sad. Well, yeah, and, you know, I was trying to write and explain to these folks that as we got closer to the end, and really for the first time in our whole history with Neil, we were of two minds, you know. And you and I were getting, as you said, sadder. But Neil was getting happier because he had made this decision to retire, to spend his life with, you know, his new family. And that's completely understandable, but it couldn't, we couldn't help but be affected by the fact that something was coming to an end without really wanting it to come to an end. Yeah. And so the last gig was strange, and I, I don't know how you remember it, but my memory of the last gig was that, you know, we were in the dressing room and it was kind of tough, because we knew we might be going out there for the last time, even though we held hope that Neil would change his mind in two months, maybe get bored of being home and come back, but... And his dressing room was like ebullient, it was a party, it was a celebration of a a career so and then we had this after party and a lot of our friends were there uh, 
I kind of felt like I was going through the motions at that party because I was so, my emotions were so mixed. I don't know how you felt. Yeah. And then we never talked with Neil afterwards. Yeah. And then we just went our separate ways. And I remember the plane ride home the next day was not a joyful no. plane ride, but partly because we stayed up most of the night drinking, but that was yeah. a whole other story. Yeah, uh, yeah and I threw up on those shoes too. So. <laughs> That's why they're this color. Yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah they used to be white, no. I think. Yeah. There was a lot of wine that night. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the aftermath of that tour was odd, because yeah. we were working on uh, the video for R40, and yet we weren't really communicating with Neil. And uh, I, I tell the story in the book how I had listened to the drum solo he had chosen, and I was so blown away by it that I just decided, fuck it, I'm gonna write him and tell him that. So I wrote him this email and said, hey man, I don't know how it's going for you there, but we're just working on this film and I wanted to know which night you used for the drum solo because it was so perfect. You really hit it out of the park. And then he just opened up, he wrote me back and he just opened up about you know his frustrations, about how he thought he had built this great drum solo, but he, Nobody had ever told him that. And I thought that was such an odd thing that he still needed reassurance from you and I, even though we just took it for granted and he's fucking Neil Peart. And he knows <laughs> how amazing <laughs> And then he wrote about um, the fact that he was the librarian at Olivia's school. And this was making him really happy. Yeah. And I thought to myself, what the fuck do I have to be resentful about? You know, yeah. he has earned a new life. You know, he earned it. And I have no business harboring any resentment for the way it came. Yeah. We got 40 great years yeah. together. So That's so amazing. I think you, I think you felt a, a, a little uh, more strongly about it. I think. Uh, I, th I, I was disappointed and saddened by it, but once we got some distance from it, I started to feel better and finding other things in my life. And right. you know, I was still playing and still interested in, in writing some music and working on some music. You know, did a couple little projects along the way uh, for that. I guess for that year afterwards. And then we found out that that Neil was ill, and then it was an enormous burden to keep that a secret as yeah, as he wanted. Really was. And you felt like you were lying to your, you know, to your friends or anybody. Ever well, we were. We were lying because. Oh, it we, seemed like it. So I guess it, we were. Yes, we were. <laughs> we were actually lying. I mean, you have to remember that it was very important for Neil, for no one to know about. It. Yeah. Uh, he took that decision, and we had no choice but to respect it and, be, and choose loyalty over honesty. And I really believe that was the right thing to do, as difficult as it was. But at first, you know, he was... Um, <laughs> um, you know, he was, he was given 18 months, at best, and yet he's such a... He was such a bull, such a strong guy, that he lasted three and a half years. So who would have expected yeah. to, have to have to carry on with that charade for three and a half years? And after a while, it became hard. It became difficult. Yeah. So when he did pass, you know, which, which was terrible, and uh, shortly afterwards, we came home, and I was left with these feelings uh, these feelings of grief that were mixed with all kinds of emotions. And that's when the pandemic hit and suddenly we were locked down and I was very aware of my mom, for example, who was uh, really struggling with uh, dementia. And so I was in a real funk. Yeah. And I don't know how you were during that early part of the pandemic, but for me, it eventually drove me to write, to look into my past to try to write this book after being spurred on by Daniel, uh, Daniel Richler, who's my co-writer and good friend. <laughs> yeah. Daniel, 
And he started writing me um, short stories about his dad, of course, the great Mordecai Richler. Uh, and uh, he would write a short note and he would say, why don't you write a memory? Write it back to me. And so I would write a little short note and it became a sort of a way to kill the time in lockdown. Uh, but mine, of course, got longer because you know me, I yeah. like to talk. <laughs> And he said, I think you're writing a book, and I think you should write a book. And I said, okay, as long as you help me. But that process was really healing for me yeah. and cathartic for me. And I needed to do it for so many reasons like that. But you seem to, to have this resilience, this brighter outlook that I was always jealous of, you know, that you could, you know, take these cataclysmic moments and put them in perspective more quickly than I could. Well, How do I'm, you do that? I, I'm a very shallow person. <laughs> <laughs> and I just... Uh, very I honest. Know, this is the... <laughs> <laughs> this is, you're shallow and empty and have no idea. That's so that's the one. Interesting to say. Yes, that's, that's, just, that's me completely. <laughs> this is why we've always worked so well together. Because you are that guy who's very methodical. You've got to do everything You've got to know everything that's wrong before you know that it's right, and you go through a, a process. And I'm the opposite of that. I lose, not that I lose interest, I just get impatient, mm -hmm. and I want to get up on it. And that's why we work well together in writing. You, you corral me when I'm like that. All, all the good stuff comes out very, very quickly, and then I'm sort of... Yeah, well, this gentleman is a spontaneous genius. I mean, <laughs> you really are. Woo! I don't know how many times... <laughs> I don't know how many times we sit down to jam, and he's plays something, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? Wait, 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 stop. <laughs> that was amazing. And I go, what? Good. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that thing you just played, those eight oh. notes in a row were a brilliant cluster. And I go, oh, okay. <laughs> and if I hadn't recorded it yeah. and played it back for you so you could relearn it, it would be, it would be <laughs> done to the ether. Yeah. So many times. Yeah, like that. yeah. But that's, that's who you are. You're just innately creative and you, it comes out in wonderful bursts. And, I've been fortunate enough to sit beside you in a tape recorder all these years and to grab those bursts. And then my job is to try to add my two cents and harness it, and then off we go. And, uh, yeah. I think it's worked out pretty well for yeah, us. Yeah, it has worked out. Yeah, thank you for <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming on my show. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, oh, and then we shit. had this life mm -hmm. of uh, thousands of years. Yeah, I mean, you could go to any period in there and, and just look so I know much. What, I know what we should talk about. What, what memories do you have of opening for other bands in the early days? Like, what was your favorite band to open for? Or more specifically, yes. do you remember opening for... Do you remember opening for Hawkwind? Oh! I, I do remember opening for Hawkwind. I remember the last show that we did with Hawkwind. Why don't you tell these fine folks about that? <laughs> well, you know, they were, they were kind of a hippie band mm. of the time. And uh, they were you know, sort of a jammy, the material was very much like that, jammy, and, and they sort of trip out on, on their stuff. So, you know, on the last show, we just thought it was appropriate to give them a gift right. uh, uh, on that last day as, as we were moving on. And I enjoyed creating these small aircraft, Brazilian Airways, right. where I'd use nine papers. Right. And maybe. Now, what were the? What yeah. was the essence of these little aircrafts? <laughs> what was inside them? Well, I'm getting to that. Oh, okay. So. <laughs> the essence was they were going to get you there. They were. So 
I, I would create these little aircraft with, as I said, the nine papers and, I don't know, three quarters of an ounce of pot. This big was fuselage. This like, was a talk about a jumbo. <laughs> They were so much fun. And of course, there's, there's, there's a rocket. Yeah, that, that is again, that's little rockets. Zone, zone Airways. Yep. And, uh, and there's, there's what's there. remaining of yeah. that uh, first one. Yeah, see, it gets you there. Uh, and uh, then here's one in flight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From the sound studios. <laughs> yes, that was a uh, location for many air crashes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Created, I mean, come on. Who, who can do it? This is back in 1974 where it was very, very illegal when we were playing in Oklahoma City with them, which was even ten times more illegal and dangerous. And it didn't seem to phase them at all because I remember we presented it to them in their dressing room. Thank you so much for having me having us on, on your tour. He said me there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having us on your tour, and you know, all that stuff, and then you presented it, and they were like, oh, wow, that's awesome, great. And they, they, they smoked it. Yeah, this was supposed to be for some other time. Yeah, and, and they, they smoked, smoked it before it. they went on stage. They had a full rocket ship. I remember standing at the side of the stage, and playing, I don't remember the guitar player's name, but he was playing, and, he, and he, at one point he put his head back like this. <laughs> and stopped playing for about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, he got the there. Airport, yeah. It's like mission accomplished. Yes. Yes. I was proud of that moment. Oh, that's a good one. There were a few like that. Yeah. We, uh, certainly when we were making some records, that was the way, steel. That's the way we kind of finished the session. Yeah, we yeah. went yeah. on a flight. Do you remember making Caress of Steel? When you say remember, <laughs> do you remember how much hash oil we smoked? Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, that was the thing then. Yeah. Um, I remember months after we finished the record, listening to it, thinking, where'd all the reverb go? I just wasn't high anymore, so no. it just sounded very different. No. Do you remember the time we played it for Paul Stanley? Yes. So, so we we were kind of proud of this record, even though clearly it was very weird. Uh, the, fountain of, the Fountain of Lime Death and the Necromancer. Uh, and we were opening for Kiss, and we took him. Was it in the bus or in the dressing room or something? It was, no, in, we the, didn't have a it bus. was in the. It was in our uh, fun craft. Our fun craft. Yeah, because we were we had the table. Yeah, we had seats. That's right. And uh, so Paul came in and we sat down, we were proud of him, we played him the record, and boy, did he look confused. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was so, he was really nice. Yeah, but he looked really scared. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I hope this all works out for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really an album. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Unfortunately, Thin Lizzy, I think, were they on that tour too? No, that was Did a we... bit later though, but we still had the fun craft. Right, yeah. Yeah. Because the fun craft was the scene for many interesting. Well, we stories. went through three motors and the fun craft. Yeah, and, 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 uh, 500,000 miles. Or... So, then Lizzie made the mistake of challenging us to a drinking contest. <laughs> you just don't challenge yeah. Canadians to a drinking contest. <laughs> Yes. And you can't touch those guys. No. <laughs> they were the winners. They were, oh my god. Remember we did that boat trip with them yes. in Vancouver? Yeah. They invited us. It was the end of the tour uh, for us. They were, uh, no, they were going on. We were hopping onto some other tour and they invited us to go out on this boat, deep sea fishing. And, you know, it's just an excuse because they were just, oh, they yeah. would just pour the booze down. It's in the middle of the day and, you know, we we're just young kids. <laughs> And I remember getting back and feeling really quite yeah. sick. 
Yeah. I just started feeling better today. <laughs> That was a big blow. Did you actually catch anything? I don't know. Was there other fish involved? I think we were green when we got on to yeah. land again. And when we got to the bar of the hotel, the guy said, Right, we'll see you in the bar in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that, I went straight to my room and passed out for two days. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Brian Robertson was good. Good for a few yeah. of those things. So we challenged, uh, they challenged us in the in the fun craft yes. and drinking contest, and it didn't end well. For no, it did not. It did not end well. For not them. only did we win, but in a way we lost because we had to clean <laughs> the fun craft. <laughs> the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That did, that took a while. That's, uh, That's true. That wasn't fun. Oh. <laughs> I was thinking, Rory Gallagher, it, you know, talking about oh, yeah. opening for yeah. a band. I, I think that may have been certainly my favorite in the early days. Yes, so. let's hear it for Rory. Yeah. <laughs> they were such a great band, but they were such beautiful people. They were so sweet. They were so considerate and kind. And I think we learned something from that, that you have to treat everybody with that same kind of respect and kindness, Absolutely. especially opening acts. Yeah. And I'm proud of the fact that throughout our whole career, we've always made a point of making it very comfortable for the opening acts right. in, in every way we can. Except maybe for the runaways. <laughs> but, but, and I'm just joking about that. I'm just joking about that. Because that, that was a story that got completely blown out, I think, more from their camp. I know they said that they peed on our guitars, well, you know, or, or my guitar, but in fact they peed on our own guitars, they were in the wrong dressing room, so <laughs> they, they failed to, you know, bring that up in, in their story, but the Rory was great, the band was great, and we opened, you know, a fairly extensive tour with him, and I remember uh, he, they went home, and then they came back, and he brought me a, a, a set of Flann O'Brien's books. He said, this is a great Irish writer, very funny, humorous. Uh, just brought this as a gift. I thought, this is Rory Gallagher. This guy's one of the greatest guitarists on the planet. And, uh, I've admired him forever. And he brings me books. What's the matter with him? It's, that's so thoughtful. And then years later, we were the uh, headliner and they and opened and up. Rory was opening for us. And he was opening so for us. Strange, and yeah. I just remember we pulled out all the stops to make sure they had everything. Yeah. But we were pretty lucky. I mean, there were only a few bands that gave us a hard time yeah. when we were opening. And, uh, you know, even Kiss in the earliest days, they were really good to us. Yes. And, and it was very rare in those days to get a, even a sound check. Uh, and as we learned, opening for uh, Aerosmith for like two right. months where we didn't get a single sound check, single. but Kiss did everything they could to make sure we got yeah, sound always. So that was, you know, a good lesson in professionalism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that stayed with us. Woo! Yeah, yeah who, else, who else treated us like shit? Let's see. Aerosmith. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, only at first. Only at first. And, the, and at and the end. later. Yeah, in the middle as well. And then years later, again. So that was okay. You know, they were doing their own thing, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are, are, are they uh, doing a book tour? No. no. <laughs> That's so Canadian. Uh, I love it. I mean, a lot. this has been going on between us since we were 13. I mean, I mean, if you guys were not here, nothing would be different. No, it would be. We'd be laughing more, actually. Yeah, I mean, we were sitting in the dressing room remembering all kinds of crazy, crazy things just before we came out here. And it's just like that. I'm so happy we have this volume of shared memories, you know. And I was really happy to share some of them in the book, but you, I, there's so many. I know. I mean, we're so fortunate. Yeah, we really were. Uh, that we or are. Are? Uh, <laughs> are? Yeah, I yeah. 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 And I think when Neil joined the band, we discovered kind of a, a fellow traveler, you know, because he had a great sense of humor 
and he fit right in with us. And within, the, for, after the first few weeks, which were strange, uh, <laughs> because well, let's talk about his audition. Shall we talk about his audition? Great, I was gonna bring that up. Okay. <laughs> Keep my feet over here. Um, so, John Rutzi, our first drummer, was a very good drummer, different style of drummer. Um, solid, uh, not uh, histrionic drum rolls, but really a good solid drummer. And he had sort of more simple rock and roll tastes. And uh, we were starting to write, be influenced by bands like Yes and Genesis. And we wanted to make our music more complex. At the same time, we had finished our first album, and there had been some problems making that record. And, and John, who had, was supposed to be in charge of writing all the lyrics, on the night we were supposed to record the vocals, he didn't show up with the lyrics and tore them all up. And we found, only found that out the next day, and I had to write the lyrics really quickly. So clearly, we were at a kind of crossroads with him. And I think he also, because you know he was diabetic and he had some health issues, health concerns, I don't think he wanted to do this tour that we had planned. So suddenly we were without a drummer. So we held an audition. Now, I had never been to an audition before. Had you? Uh, not, not for us, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm asking him questions. That's, that's so good. <laughs> and so we held this audition. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing, but we agreed that we wouldn't talk, make any decision. Right. Till we heard all four drummers. Oh, four. There were four. Were you, were you, were you one of them? <laughs> <laughs> I remember three. But you remember three? There, Neil, uh, Jerry Fielding, and, and the, the guy with the, the guy, yeah. orange hair. I remember the color of his hair. Yeah. I thought that yeah. was the first guy that I had no memory of him. Well, Jerry, actually, Jerry, he was the first. He, he toured with us. He, he, no, no, he played. He yeah, filled he, in for, for John for a month or two. Or... I know, I was there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I recognize oh, you now. <laughs> so, yeah, so Jerry came first. Yeah, Jerry, so Jerry was a done deal, and then Neil, and then the, the, that last guy came. Remember, he had a, a, a little Volkswagen bug. No, I don't the remember. Beatles? Yeah, he, he, he had his drums in the, and he brought them out and he set them up. I think he had a, like his kick, a snare, a yeah. floor tom, and one tom. Yeah, he had a simple kit and Very he, he wrote charts. He had charts all the and, songs. But the best part of it is we, we finished, with Jerry left, yeah. and this Ford Pinto pulls up. Right. And this guy who's not wearing a shirt, he's got short hair, and we're laughing at people with short hair. <laughs> Hair, this guy's he doesn't even have any velvet pants. <laughs> <laughs> and so he hops out of the car, bounds out of the car. He, you know, big, he was yeah. a big, lively cat. And he pulls out these green garbage bags that have drums in them. And he brings them in. He sets up a kit that's two, uh, made out of two, and there was a Rogers kit with two small 18 inch bass drums. And he's setting it up, and Alex and I are looking, this is fucking goof. <laughs> this is not gonna work out. Yeah, this Maybe is... just put him back in the garbage bags again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, he tunes the drums, and then he starts playing like. <laughs> Try to show off. Triplets that <laughs> wouldn't end. Yeah. And I'm really smiling <laughs> and really excited now because I knew this is fucking magic and so I started talking to him excitedly but you weren't happy no, about I was like well, his hair is pretty short <laughs> <laughs> and I was breaking the rule and I was talking yeah. to him like he was already in the band and, and we played through the songs from the first album and then we played that bit in 7-8 uh, that eventually became the song Anthem and he had no problem playing that. I mean, yeah. he was just killing it. So I, I was sold, and, and you were like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, at, at first. But as the day, because if you remember, he came 
relatively early in the morning, I think 11-ish, uh, and we were there. <laughs> well, you know, musicians. Yeah, 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 really. yeah. What's the matter with you? <laughs> and we were there until 11 at night, which was still was pretty that, early. Did they go that late? <laughs> yeah, we did go that late, because oh, I think they had a curfew there for 11 o'clock. Do you remember talking was, about memory? I mean, it's just... And I, I remember that, ah, what's this? That's your foot. And I remember, you know, it's <laughs> where did that come it's from? It's pretty gross. So. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, the whole day we were talking about everything. World events, literature, music. We smoked a joint, we had a bite to eat, we played. To now, I, play. I remember, Neil, thinking that you didn't like him because you didn't want to talk about it. And it wasn't until that very polite drummer that followed him where you kind of went, ah, okay. Yeah, well, that was... <laughs> that yeah. other guy was probably better. Yeah, well, I knew he was better, <laughs> and I knew he was great, but I wanted to wait and see. What if the next guy was great as well, but had long hair? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just, you never know. And that was the deal, right? That was we the deal. had a deal, I right? Broke the, I broke the deal. That was my deal. <laughs> so I broke the deal, because I... Because it was fucking Neil Elwood Peart playing our song. Yeah. 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 So, uh, it was that guy. But once the audition was was done, and we decided, it felt like he was in the band. Yeah. And then the next week, uh, he came down, we started rehearsing, and then we went to Long and McQuaid's here in Toronto. Yeah. Because we had gotten our very first ever advance from the record company, and we could go shopping. And so he wasn't even in the band for a week before he got his pick of any drum kit. And I got to buy my Rickenbacker that I had been dreaming about for years. And we bought a Les Paul. A Les Paul, a Marshall Amp. Like, was that not the best that day? That was ever? the best day ever. <laughs> It's like we won a game show or something. Yeah. Like if you're a musician and you're young and you go to the, you go to a music store on the weekends or whatever and you just drool and then eventually once after you stop crying you leave. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe come back a couple hours later and go through that whole process again. So to be there and actually have money in our pocket to buy the equipment that we were no, drooling over it was. It, and you know, you know it, was, it felt like it was their money, but it wasn't their money, it was oh. our money. Yeah. We didn't realize that an advance means an advance on royalties. So it's really, yeah. it's our cash. So. Yeah. But it didn't feel like it. And not at the time. And it, it was it, great. It was awesome. I remember, <laughs> I can, yeah. honestly, I can remember the showroom where the gear was set up. Yeah. And it was a sunny day. It was late afternoon. I can, Clearly, remember the whole thing. Yeah, me too. And I remember looking at that Ricky bass. I don't know how many times I'd seen one of them hanging on the wall. I never thought I would own one. So, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then, a week and a half later, we were on tour together yeah. with this new guy. And this is the new guy. And, uh, you know, I remember us, the first couple of gigs, we didn't really know him. But he had a great sense of humor, and we were laughing a lot. And and we also had another new guy, Howard, or, who Hearns, who is here tonight. Let's hear it for him. Uh, <laughs> who was our tour manager, and he was an American. He was a New Jerseyite from America. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. And uh, so this was a real education, you know. First gig was in Pittsburgh at the Civic Arena. I remember checking. We flew in on an airplane and everything, yeah. taking flights instead of driving. It was yeah. amazing. I remember. Uh, I remember almost crashing into uh, that. We were taking a taxi. And we almost hit another car, uh, and the taxi driver leaned out of the window and said, "Pardon my language." He said, "I'll slit your throat, you sucker." Uh, <laughs> 
and we thought, oh, welcome to America. This is a different experience. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for your evocative expression of frustration. Um, and then we got to the hotel, and I was sharing a room with her. And That's right, we were all sharing rooms. Yeah, at the, the Webster time. Hall Hotel. That's yeah. the kind of yeah. Yeah. idiotic minutiae that I remember. Uh, and then it was the first gig, opening for Uriah Heep and Romantic Manser. Yeah. And we had 26 minutes to play. Right. There was a new venue that that was a brand new arena that had, you know, a, a retractable, retractable roof. roof. Yeah. And we got there, we were so excited, and all the dressing rooms were here, and they, the whoever came out and said, oh, no, 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 your dressing room is dip down this hall. <laughs> and after about an hour and a half of walking down that hall, we got to the little tiny dressing room. But it was still great, and there was yeah. booze in it. There was actual, there was actual there was bottle alcohol. of, like yeah, there was a blue nun, I think, and, <laughs> and some Heineken, some Heineken, and a deli tray, and, and wow. my, my half bottle of Southern Comfort, Southern Comfort, which I ordered for I don't, I don't know why, but Howard was saying, you know, you can get booze on your rider, so you should order some booze, and I said, I, I don't drink spirits, I didn't really know what to order, and I had read that, to, you know, a lot of the cool rock Janice bands. Joplin. Janice Joplin. Used to, Joplin and you kind of look like her, so. So before we went on, I took a shot of this stuff, and I was dizzy for the whole 26 minutes we were on stage. It was just like, huh, it's over? Wow. How were we? Yeah. That was exciting, though. The, the the roof was open. It, you know, it was early. We were we were an opener, yeah. and people were still coming in. There was there were only about ten percent of the audience was in the building, and the stage, the portion of the stage that we got was the size of this table. It we <laughs> was like tiny, yeah. little, right on the edge. Yeah, but it was but, awesome. Wow, was it ever it was really amazing. exciting? I think it was exciting. I don't remember it. I was so dizzy. Nah, you were <laughs> <drunk. laughs> And we did four shows with them, and, and that's really the tour we got to know Neil. Yeah. And we saw this alien in our midst, and we were like, hmm, he reads a lot. Maybe, maybe he wants to write the lyrics. Yeah, maybe. I think he does. That would be great. <laughs> so we said eventually, we said, hey, you, whatever your name is, you want to write some lyrics for us? I think it was a, something as simple as that. Yeah. And we want to give you a job. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think the first song he wrote was Beneath Between and Behind. Woo! Yeah. Woo! I was thinking, wow, there's really a lot of words in this song. <laughs> there were a lot of words. We better that. write a very fast song yeah. to go along with it. Yeah, and because that's easier for a singer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it was, you know, I listened to that song. And for the longest time, I thought, ah, this song is too fast, this song is too fast. But I listened to it the other day, and you know, it, it, it holds up. It's, it, it sounded, mm, yeah. it sounded yeah. 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 It's a cool song. Yeah. And then, it, you know, the song is about, obviously, America. And he was just, you know, channeling all the experiences we were having as a young, a young band. Yep, and that's how he continued. He wrote his whole career as a lyricist. Yeah, yeah. He got pretty good at it. I he was not bad. <laughs> he, he did know a lot of words. A lot of words, of course, you eliminated from the songs <laughs> in the early process. Yes, yes. For, for good reason, by the way. Yeah. But I thought we developed, him and I developed a pretty good relationship yes. yeah. with lyrics. Yeah, for sure. I had to express his thoughts and I had to make them my own. And, and, he, and put them in, 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 in the context of a singer. That's right. That's, that's the other thing, a rock singer. It's, because I know his lyrics could sometimes be very, very deep, like very wordy, uh, and not sometimes not easy to get the essence of. Right. Uh, maybe too complicated or complex. Well, but, I mean, we had to talk about it. But you—that's that's what I mean. Yeah. You guys talked about it, and you yeah. you would filter them in in a way that they sounded like a song, like. Yeah. Lyrics to a song instead yeah. of from a book or something. But as we grew, as you know, the three of us as writing partnerships, uh, you know, I thought he, right from the get go, was pretty um, objective and ego free yeah. when we had something to say about 
a, a lyric that he'd written. And I remember him saying, well, I was happy just to have written it. <laughs> if we didn't use it, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't think I would have been so uh, magnanimous uh, yeah. as I'd been about a part if he didn't like it. But, yeah. but we spent so much time in such close company and so much time laughing together yeah. that when it came to work, those things worked themselves out pretty yeah. easily, didn't yeah. they? Yeah. I mean, it was pretty remarkable. Yeah. And he became very open to any suggestions I would have to move, you know, one part of the song here or, or whatnot to change the lyrics. And he was happy to go back and work it yeah. as long as he didn't lose what he felt was important about the song's theme. And that was really a beautiful thing to, to be involved in a yeah. partnership like that. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah.